LA at SciArc in our new home. And I want to thank Warren and Francis Anderton and everybody on the Which Way LA staff and team for uh, putting this program together. Of course, it's about issues of uh, great concern to us, both as, as architects and as citizens in the city of LA. And, and um, I want to thank you all. And uh, Warren will introduce all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. This is an unusual situation for us, as I think all of you can uh, imagine, and it's an unusual situation for all of us, I guess, to be in this confirmation, but hopefully it'll work in terms of the acoustics and everybody will be able to hear. Uh, we're going to go on the air in about uh, three and a half minutes, and uh, for those of you who've heard our program, I'll just do my standard introductory, uh, uh, make my standard introductory remarks. I'll then introduce the uh, panelists. Uh, hold your applause, if you will, till I've introduced them all, and then I'll give you an opportunity to be heard by our listening audience. The purpose of our being here is to give you an opportunity to ask questions of uh, some very interesting and some very important people about the things that are on your mind. Uh, I will open by asking each of them a very brief, or, well, I'll ask them broad, broad questions, uh, which I hope they will spend uh, a relatively brief time answering at the outset so we can sort of indicate where they're all coming from, and then we'll go from there, and they'll be able to elaborate on their remarks as the uh, evening goes on. We're going to go for an hour from 6.30 to 7.30, live uh, on the air. There's a possibility we may be able to go longer than that on the air, but we're going to uh, give our guests a chance to uh, depart the scene at that point if they need to at 7.30 because uh, we didn't tell them we were going to go for an extra half hour. Uh, we will, I think, be on the internet for that half hour uh, period, uh, presuming that uh, some of our guests will remain for it. And so uh, that period will be uh, available as well. I'm so glad that uh, everybody has quieted down a bit, and uh, it does seem possible to hear one another. Uh, we'll have people in the, in the audience, circulating in the audience with uh, wireless microphones. Kyle, uh, where are you? Okay, here's one over here. And we'll have, I think, somebody closer to the back moving around. Uh, hold your hand up if you want to ask a question, and uh, uh, we will recognize you. Please don't make speeches. The uh, purpose here is to ask questions of the, uh, uh, the elected officials and the others who are with us. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we're, we won't hand you the microphone. The microphone person holds onto it like grim death. Uh, lest uh, we lose control of the situation. Not that anyone here, I'm sure, would want to violate any, uh, any uh, the usual rules of courtesy. So that's it, and uh, we're now 55 seconds away, 50 seconds away from, uh, from going on the air. We'll hear a little music. I'll do my song and dance, introduce the um, guests, and we will sail into the program from there. So let me ask you, if you will, to be, be uh, continue to be uh, quiet while I shuffle through my papers here. Uh, we got 30 seconds. Eclectic weekdays from 9 till noon at 89.9 KCRW. News is available online whenever you want it from NPR, BBC, PRI, and The Voice of America. You'll find it at kcrwworldnews.com. Coming up this evening on KCRW at 7.30, music in Metropolis. And then at 10 o'clock, Chocolate City with Garth Trinidad. Next, Which Way L.A.? The time is 6.30. Which Way L.A. is made possible in part by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation, which support study and research into policy issues of the Los Angeles region. How does a 21st century city live with 21st century war? Hello again, I'm Armin Alney, and this is a special edition of Which Way LA, KCRW's ongoing series on the issues Southern Californians care about. We are live at Sci Arc, that's the Southern California Institute of Architecture. It's a remodeled freight depot, an industrial section of downtown Los Angeles. Sci Arc's move here from the west side is part of downtown's revival. This broadcast originally was intended to be a discussion of redevelopment in the heart of the city. But then came September 11th, then the counter assault in South Asia, and now the warnings of what might be next and how long it might take before it's all over. So we changed the subject. 
Since Los Angeles is often called America's 21st city, 21st century city, how will it be affected by what's being called the redefining challenge of the 21st century? How will Los Angeles prepare? How will it respond? How will all of us live with uncertainty and this new sense of vulnerability? We changed the subject and we added to our panel LA Mayor Jim Hahn, County Sheriff Lee Baca, Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, all are elected public officials with new responsibilities. Dr. Maher Hatut of the Islamic Center, civil rights lawyer and public citizen Constance Rice, downtown redeveloper Tom Gilmore are with us as well. They're all crowded onto a tiny platform here at Sarah Arc and they are ready to answer questions from an eager audience. Audience, let our listeners know you're here. A great audience at Cy Arc. I'm going to ask each of our guests a, a very general question. Any one of them could take 15 or 20 minutes to answer it, but I'm going to try to limit them to just a couple so that we'll get a sense of where they're coming from and each of them will have a chance to speak. Uh, after that's happened, if I can resist answering uh, follow-up questions myself, we'll go to the audience and uh, give you the opportunity we promised, which is the chance to ask questions of our guests yourselves. I'm going to start with Mayor Jim Hahn, Mayor of the City of Los Angeles. Thanks for being with us. Well, it's nice to be here. Here, Warren. Tell us this. After all that has happened, how do you feel about it, and how do you think it's going to affect the city of Los Angeles? I'll answer the second part of the question. I think Los Angeles is safe. I, that's a message that I've been talking about a lot, that I want people to go on with their lives. I want people to understand that we are doing everything we can in the police department, the fire department, other emergency personnel, to make sure that we're safe. We're working very closely with the sheriff of Los Angeles County, Lee Baca. The community is safe. Today I went out to uh, our uh, water filtration uh, and testing lab out uh, in the San Fernando Valley for DWP, making sure that our water is safe a lot of people are concerned about that. A lot of people, though, Warren, felt like uh, the new millennium really began uh, September 11th, 2001. And if this is the way the 21st century is going to begin, it, it, it certainly causes us all to realize that the world has changed somewhat. Uh, we want to understand that we're taking the precautions necessary, but we want to go forward with our lives. Uh, certainly, that's the message that I'm talking about, is that we want to understand that. I know it's hard for people to say, well, gee, Mayor, you say you go out and spend money and go shopping and go to the movies or go to a restaurant, but you know, my neighbor down the street lost their job. Well, the point is if we all, you know, go into our houses and shut the door and, and pull the drapes, uh, then the next job that may be lost may be your own. So we need to understand that we're all connected in this and that we need to move forward in this. The other issues I think that for the city, a city as diverse as Los Angeles is, to understand that this is a place that's attracted people from all over the world. A lot of people who may look different than you, dress different than you, talk differently than you do, uh, but we're all here as Angelinos, we're all here as Americans, and it's important for us all to pull together and not to to uh, discriminate, to not to uh, you know make preconceptions or stereotypes about anybody, and it's real important right now that we all pull together. Want to give us that personal note? How do you feel? How do I feel? Well, you know, I was in Washington D.C., right adjacent to the White House, at the moment that the uh, plane struck the Pentagon, and, and we just heard about the planes hitting the World Trade Center. That was a scary feeling for me personally. That to realize that after all those years of drop drills and stuff, when I was in elementary school, the nation was actually under attack from the air, and that was a chilling moment. But since that day, I think I feel very good. I feel very good about the way Americans are responding, that uh, we are not letting fear conquer us, and that we're going to conquer our fears, and that we have the resolve to pull together, understanding that this is going to be a long fight that we're in for, but one that, that needs to be fought. So I feel much better now than those first few seconds when I didn't know what else was going to come from the sky. Mayor Jim Hahn. Lee Baca, Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Same question to you. How do you feel? What's, how's it going to affect us? I think all of us have a great degree of concern at this moment, and I think that this concern is going to remain with us for a while. However, we in Los Angeles County are well prepared to address any possible terrorist attacks. Uh, within my command as a sheriff over a region that is large, 
terms of emergency response, we have the ability to muster up thousands of deputy sheriffs and firefighters, and we have excellent bomb squads, and we have dogs that sniff for particular bombs that are out there. And we've been fortunate because we haven't been able to detect anything that re represents a serious threat at this time. But I think also that my concerns are that we continue forward as our mayor has indicated, and we also have a great strong board of supervisors, of which Supervisor Yaroslavsky is here, and speak to that, Pat, to that point. Um, but my concerns are that we continue forward in a planning process that allows all Angelinos and people who live in Los Angeles County uh, to feel comfortable that law enforcement and fire safety services are working in a coordinated fashion. And now that Governor Davis has weighed in with creating a California Anti-Terrorist Information Center, uh, of which he's charged me with chairing, we are going to collect intelligence information throughout our state that will give us a heads up on any kind of planned activity terrorist activity that's going on in California. So I feel optimistic as the mayor does, and yet I know that I've got a lot of work to do. A little more personal reflection. Can you share it with us? Well, I think for me, it was just absolutely appalling that what happened in New York exactly ha happened. I, I think it's disgusting. I think it speaks ill of human mankind. Uh, I think it's a tragedy that has occurred undoubtedly and that those who committed that crime committed one of the greatest crimes against humanity and that all of the cloaking that they can provide uh, regarding their religion is inexcusable. The religion has nothing to do with it. Uh, these are deranged people that need to be taken to town. Ask. Sheriff Lee Baca, thank you very much. Xavier Slavki is a county supervisor uh, for Los Angeles, represents the third district. Uh, supervisor, same questions to you. So on a personal level, Warren, uh, I was also in Washington at the same time uh, Mayor Hahn was. Uh, in fact, I was out in a morning jog, if you will, uh, just before the plane went into the Pentagon, and I was at the Memorial Bridge. Uh, just before that happened. It, it was, uh, on a personal level, uh, I, I, I think of that reporter who watched the Hindenburg go down uh, many years ago who said, oh, the humanity. And each one of those six or 7,000 people who lost their lives is a family, is a story, is a, is a, a nonfiction biography. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a tragedy multiplied that many times over, and, and I, I think it, it settled in shortly afterwards that the personal tragedies of so many people, and I think it's affected us all. It's changed us all, whether we acknowledge it or recognize it. It has changed us all uh, forever, and uh, it'll be a, a while yet before we figure out exactly exactly how. Uh, in, in terms of, of our community and, and our response, uh, uh, we are, in this county, uh, as prepared as any county in America uh, for this kind of a situation. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, Fortunately, we have a lot of experience with disasters, uh, earthquakes, floods, fires. Uh, we have practice in this almost every year in Los Angeles County. Uh, but having said that we are as prepared as any county in America, I don't think any county in America, including our own, is prepared for the kind of thing that happened in New York on that massive a scale. Uh, I think this event of September 11th will change our, our thinking, completely change our thinking. Uh, in a way, our time finally was up on September 11th. Uh, we've been living on borrowed time. There are a lot of other countries and other parts of the world uh, that have had military at their airports as a matter of routine, uh, that check people's bags thoroughly as a matter of routine, uh, where being at the airport three hours early is a matter of routine. For us, it's, it's a new phenomenon, and it's one we're going to get used to living with, and, and we're going to have to. But at the bottom line of all of this is that uh, we, our thinking will, will have to change uh, in terms of, of preparedness. Uh, we no longer can, can be prepared just for the one event or, or the several hundred casualties. We now have to think in terms of thousands and, and even tens of thousands of casualties. The last thing I want to say uh, and, and not forget about is this is an economic disaster and there are going to be other casualties as a result of September 11th. Uh, when one company announces it's going to lay off 31,000 employees, one company, uh, that's another kind of disaster. 31,000 households uh, without a breadwinner. Uh, when you look at the tens of thousands of people who are going to lose their jobs because of changes in circumstance. Our government needs to be in a position to respond. The governor 
governor, uh, the president, need to ratchet up assistance to people at this time as a transitional measure, uh, not pull the plug on, on assistance. Uh, I, I think and you and I have talked on, on your show, Warren, about the, the, the proposals in Washington on, on health care. Here we are talking about ratcheting up our trauma capabilities, and at the same time in Washington there is a proposal that would, that would uh, constrain, if not collapse, our trauma system uh, here in California. So we need to have a seamless kind of a policy making in Washington, Sacramento, and at the local level that reinforces our ability to respond not only to what happened on September 11th, not only to prevent other September 11ths, but also to deal with the casualties that are coming as a result of September 11th in the way of unemployment and other kinds of crises. Xavier Oslovsky, 3rd District Supervisor, Los Angeles County. Dr. Maher Hatout speaks for the Islamic Center of Southern California. He's a senior advisor to the Muslim Public Affairs Council as well. Dr. Hatout, good to have you with us. Same questions to you. How do you feel? What's the impact going to be? Well, I think uh, I feel a multifaceted uh, disaster and the trauma. Number one, the tragedy itself and its impact on all of us as Americans. And number two, the tragedy for our community, the Muslim community. Uh, in the towers, we lost uh, about 800 people, innocent, uh, life-earning people who who died there with the rest of the very dear several thousand Americans. Number three, we had to face the concern about the community and the way this will be read. Number four, uh, the anger and the sadness that our the name of our religion that is blasphemed by those who perpetrated this or those who supported them uh, into that uh, tragedy that is definitely uh, is the antithesis of any human decency or any religion of God. So for us it has been the pain multiplied several times and we definitely are uh, still uh, living with it. It's interesting that three members of the panel has been in Washington DC on that day. I also was in Washington DC after we worked very hard to get audience with the President of the United States to talk about uh, American Muslim concerns. On that very day, the crime was committed and of course the meeting was delayed. And I got stuck in Washington DC and seeing a different scene of Washington that gave me very painful memories because I saw the capital of the United States uh, with military vehicle and the personnel in the streets. It reminded me of areas that I came from and of sceneries that because of it, I opted to be an American. So I, I want you to know that those of us who came to America have more share of America than those who are taking America for granted. We are the ones who know what it means to have people in fatigue, in battle fatigues, and in military vehicles and armed jeeps in the streets of a city. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. And so we, we definitely lived with that. Uh, this is, uh, Los Angeles is the most diverse city in the world. And one of the concerns is with all this diversity, how are we going to explain ourselves, to express ourselves, and to live with our neighbors and our students and our patients and our etc. I would say, and I'd like to, to, to put it on record, that Los Angeles, Los Angelinos, citizens as well as government and elected official, officials restored my faith in America, reassured me that 32 years ago I made the right decision when I decided to be here. And I'm, uh, I'm very indebted to the support, the compassion, and the warmth that we as Muslim Americans got from all people and uh, we are in that together until we prevail. 
Dr. Maher Hatut, to thank you for being with us. Tom Gilmore, manager of Gilmore Associates, a property development company in downtown Los Angeles, uh, on the board of SciArc, the institution where we are standing at this time, and uh, a recent visitor to New York. Tom Gilmore. Uh, yes, thank you, Warren. Uh, yeah, I just got back from New York. This I was there this past weekend, um, and it's quite an amazing sight. Uh, it's a very funny thing. Uh, the, the world really has changed an awful lot between uh, before September 11th and after September 11th. Uh, and, and I think one of the ironies of it is that, uh, at least certainly in Los Angeles, three of the groups that, that perhaps we all felt the most ambivalent about, or perhaps even hostile towards, um, were government, uh, law enforcement, and, uh, and perhaps, uh, with the exception of this program, the media. And, um, and I think... <laughs> Well, I had the. Uh, I, I think, and I think it's really important that this fundamental change has now occurred. That the, these are the people we count on the most right now to sort of bring our community together. Uh, we're very, very fortunate, and and I'm not being you know sort of uh, overly forthcoming here in, in saying that I think we happen to have absolutely the right mayor at this time, absolutely the best sheriff in, in uh, around right now, and a, and a county supervisor who really know what they're doing. And I think government really performs well under circumstances like this, and we have to rely on on them for some of the issues that are closest to our hearts right now, like security, safety, and the continuance uh, of the government of the United States. Um, I'm a private sector guy, though. Um, I, and, be, and being a private sector guy, I'm really all about business right now. And so I'm not going to be worrying about the safety of the average Angelino. I'm not going to be worried about how government works. Uh, what I'm really going to be worried about is how business works. And having gone to New York and seen the courage and the stamina of that city, uh, it made me first proud to have been a New Yorker in the first place. But um, number two, it made me feel an absolute obligation to do my best as a business person to do our part, which is to simply conduct business and conduct it the best we possibly can, and if anything, conduct it better than we ever have before. So I'm in this odd position where um, part of me feels the damage of what has occurred and part of me feels um, th the obligation of continuing not just as well as I did before, but better than we did before. So I'm oddly optimistic that, that, we're, that we are actually about to see the best of Ange Los Angeles and the best of the An Los Angeles business community community. Tom Gilmore, Gilmore Associates. Finally, our last panelist, Constance Rice, civil rights lawyer, a co-director of the Advancement Project, uh, formerly with the Department of Water and Power, was on the board of, uh, of commissioners of that uh, agency, has served in many uh, public uh, positions in Los Angeles. Uh, Connie Rice, uh, same questions to you. How do you feel? What's it going to do? Well, Warren, about 15 years ago, I worked on the 88th floor of Tower 2, the World Trade Center. And uh, the morning, my father called me at 7, and my dad doesn't call me. I have to call him. So I knew it was an emergency, and he told me, turn the TV on. And as that tower collapsed and disintegrated, he dropped the phone, and my mother picked it up, and I said, where's dad? Because I was just in shock. I was just in shock. Uh, just stunned and thinking of the people I worked with and in tears. And uh, my mother said, I said, where's dad? And she said, he's downstairs looking for his uniform. He was an Air Force officer for 25 years and he flew fighter planes. And he was yelling, why aren't they scrambling? Why aren't they scrambling the F-16s? My 73-year-old father was getting ready to put his uniform on and go scramble the F-16s. I put him on the phone and I told him, I said, you're 73 years old, the only thing you're scrambling this morning is your eggs. <laughs> I feel like I'm waiting to exhale because I don't think we have ever faced anything this cataclysmic as an entire people. And I don't think, while I believe we're going to get through it and we will preserve our liberty and the values that make us the country we are and should become, I don't think we have the eyes, the ears, the cultural fluency or any experience to be able to say we're there. I'm waiting. And I think, we, I think LA has some of the best politicians in the country. Uh, and you've got 
the three up here are really, although I've sued them all. <laughs> And we'll probably and will, and will again. And probably uh, yeah. will again. <laughs> it's a living. <laughs> Actually, it's not a living. It's an avocation. <laughs> they are some of the very best thinkers, and I have great admiration from them for them. And but nonetheless, I don't think we have the training. We've barely mastered law enforcement in peacetime. There is no training for terrorists. Our FBI agents do not have a training paradigm for terrorists except for one little tiny unit. We don't have the hospitals. Our public health system is hanging by a thread because public health only serves the poor. The rest of us can afford to pay for it. We now need public health and Zev is going to figure it out. We have starved our public systems, including law enforcement. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we're ready. We don't know what questions to ask, not only here, but in the theater. And Godspeed to my cousin and Colin Powell. Um, given that we've decided to do a militaristic response in part, uh, I hope that we're not about to trigger the dominoes that could lead to another cataclysm. And so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm waiting to exhale, Warren. I just, I, I, we're, I, I pray that we're gonna be able to preserve our liberties. Uh, we're doing some silly things now. We've also done some good things. So I'm hopeful, but uh, not ready to bless everything that's going on right now. Your reference to your cousin, uh, Condoleezza Rice, is your uh, first cousin. Uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on your relationship uh, with her, but I think it's interesting you, you brought it up. And uh, uh, tell us, is, is it a close relationship? Is she someone you speak to on a regular basis? Connie and I made it as adults. And we found out that we were both potty trained too severely, and we're both obsessive, we're both uh, compulsive and demanding and controlling. Our politics are different and we approach solutions differently, but I, I do believe Condoleezza is extraordinarily organized and extremely demanding. You will notice that the day after the president issued the almost absurdly inapt word crusade, he's never uttered it since. That's Condoleezza. <laughs> All right, time for the audience. Let's go back here. I'm Richard Ronaldo from West Los Angeles, and I'd like to know if it's possible to discuss what kinds of resources exist to anticipate future terrorist acts as opposed to reacting to what has happened. What sort of resources do we have to anticipate and prevent future yes. actions rather than reacting to them? Sheriff, let's start with you. Los Angeles County has an early warning terrorist group that's been in place for several years. If you recall during the Y2K uh, point in history, uh, the FBI working in, in concert with other law enforcement agencies as well as Canadian law enforcement intercepted one of the bin Laden group members at the border in Canada coming across with explosives to blow up LAX and thereby intercepted him, put him in prison, and now he's one of the key informants describing what the entire Bin Laden uh, Al Qaeda organization is all about. Uh, we in Los Angeles County, as Supervisor Yaroslavsky mentioned and the mayor mentioned, is a county that has experienced quite a few things. We're the largest county in the United States, 10 million people. We're the most diverse county in the United States, and we have a great degree to be proud of. At the same time, with all the earthquakes and, and fires and civil unrest that we've had, as Supervisor Yaroslavsky alluded to, uh, we are very, very prepared here. And the statewide anti-terrorism information center that we're developing now is being, is being carbon copied from Los Angeles. Uh, the FBI here locally is very accustomed to sharing information, and we're very accustomed to working with them in this anti-terrorism group. Uh, my belief is that we always need more. You know, the, the goal that I have to achieve is to be your number one worrier about getting things done so that you don't have to do that. And, and so I'm pushing very, very hard uh, to get more federal resources, as is Congresswoman Jane Harmon, as is Senator Dianne Feinstein, and there's a whole need now with this new uh, Secretary of Home Security uh, to come forward and make law enforcement a holistic system and get rid of the turf.
turf battles that have gone on in the past. So we're going forward and I think we're doing some good things. What do you need in the way of new resources and to what extent will it impact the uh, programs that the government uh, already is, uh, is trying to keep going? Well, at the current time, what we need to do is finish off the California plan for the Anti-Terrorist Information Center. That's a key piece because in, Sh in Sh San Jose, for example, police officers on the street found air, air flight manuals and paraphernalia from this group. We also know that in San Diego there was a, an attempt on one member of this terrorist group to get flight training. And therefore, regulations need to be brought to bear on people who are, and I can't even imagine this, all interested in is flying the plane once it's off the ground. They never cared about flying the plane into a landing. I mean, this is, you know, wake up here, folks. This isn't a person that's really interested in being an airline pilot. And, and so we dropped the ball. And let me say this about intelligence gathering. The difficulties are the interpretation of the data. When you start doing intelligence work against foreign nationals who speak different languages, you have to be able to interpret what's being said. And we have to have the wiretap capability and the Title VII uh, TAP capabilities that are allowing us to legally do this sort of work. All this stuff is what I have to worry about and, and, and push forward with the federal government, but we're doing it, and I think it's important uh, to say that we, sure, we could use more gas masks, there's no question about that. We could use uh, a greater degree of technology. Right now, there is an effort to bring that forward uh, in a cohesive plan with the federal government, uh, but right now, the likelihood of Angelinos getting shot by some gang member is more high, is a higher scale of threat than a particular terrorist coming forward. And, and I think that we have to balance our thinking and do the things that Mr. Gilmore indicated and go and live a normal life knowing full well that your law enforcement and fire people are doing as much as they can. I want to uh, put this question to Supervisor Yaroslavsky and in the meantime remind you that uh, you, if you signal to the people that have the microphones, you'll be able to ask a question. Uh, Supervisor the question was, do you have the resources to take the preventive action? Uh, you're very interested, I know, in the public health system. Constance Rice said earlier that it's uh, falling apart. But what's the status of the pu public health system? What if we had a situation like they're having, for example, in South Florida? Well, uh, the South Florida situation, you're referring to the anthrax. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think we are equipped here to handle uh, that kind of a situation on a scale that they have in Florida. Now, if we had a situation that had five or 10,000 people uh, afflicted simultaneously, let me tell you something. There isn't a society on the planet that's, that's capable of responding to that sort of thing. Uh, and this is not a, a Los Angeles problem. This is a national problem. Uh, there, there is talk about smallpox. I mean, this has been in the news, and, and I, I don't feel inhibited about talking about it, but uh, there, there's presumed to be some 10 to 15 million, I've heard those two figures, uh, smallpox vaccines uh, around the United States. It is, it is speculated by some in the medical profession that, uh, that few, if any of them, are any good because they've been on the shelf for so long. Uh, and it takes a long time to produce those vaccines. Now, yeah, these are the kinds of things that before September 11th, who among us, who among us would have thought uh, in these terms? Now, there were some people who thought about it, and they were basically relegated off to the to the side of kooks. They are no longer kooks. The tragedy, other than the loss of life and all that we've talked about thus far, the tragedy of September 11th is it's going to force us to think like them. That's the tragedy. Uh, that we will now have to, I, I saw a news item today, Warren, that the President of the United States has called in Hollywood producers uh, and screenwriters to give him some ideas or the administration some ideas on what terrorists might think of doing now. Use their imagination because those of us in the bureaucracy don't have that kind of an imagination. Those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of things that we are now being forced to do. So whereas on September 10th, we weren't too concerned about the number of smallpox vaccines on, on the shelf or how many prescriptions of Cipro uh, were available to the general public. Today, it's, it's a different ball game. I think we're prepared on a, on a nominal scale. On a massive scale, it, it's a different story. I wanted to say one other thing uh, about preparedness. Uh, I have been as big a critic of intelligence abuse in law enforcement as any public official in the United States. And nothing fries me more than the police or the FBI or anybody else using their powers 
for nefarious purposes, uh, using it against law-abiding citizens. And I am equally as outraged when the powers that are available to law enforcement that could stop bona fide criminals from doing what they do are not properly used or not, or as the sheriff was just alluding to, things were not recognized. Some of the people who were involved in this were, were being watched, actually being watched. They were on a list. We lost them. Uh, what the reasons were, and now is not the time to, to post, do a post-mortem, but at some point we need to do a post-mortem to see what went wrong here on that list of people that we were watching and, and plug that hole. There's a lot that needs to be done. And and uh, you know, short of becoming a police state, which I don't think any of us want to see happen, as Dr. Hadhut uh, eloquently said. All right, let's go back to the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, George Whitesides. I'm a student here at SciArc. Um, as this is being hosted at a at a school of architecture, I think it's appropriate to ask uh, one or, or more members of the panel what their thoughts are on uh, what should be built um, now. Uh, you know, what's appropriate to build on the site or or not to build on the site, um, and what constraints uh, influence uh, those decisions. Tom Gilmore. Well, let me firmly say, build whatever the hell you want. Uh, I, I think that uh, the fact that the, the World Trade Center was a target is perhaps no great surprise, but that could have been any tall building in any city in the world. It could have been the Eiffel Tower. Uh, I think over-responding to this, certainly in terms of architecture, is a, is a critical mistake. I, in fact, I think making any architect, architectural decision based on this tragedy, making decisions based on that over the next few months is, is simply folly. I, I think that you know, we are a nation that builds. We are a nation that builds tall buildings and we build urban dense areas. It's a good idea. It'll always be a good idea. Um, you can't plan the future based on fear. It's just a huge error. And for architects, who are, who are optimists by nature, I pray. Um, we should never, ever let fear uh, be the thing that uh, defines our architecture. Constance Rice. I agree, fear should never determine what anybody does. Uh, but close to 6,000 people died there, and in my mind, it's a mass grave. And whatever we build there, I think, has to recognize the sacred nature of that site. We are going to take a very brief, excuse me, Mayor Han, did you want to come in? I just, uh, I thought it was interesting. I was on the first passenger flight to leave Dulles Airport uh, from Washington, D.C., and a young man across the aisle from me uh, said uh, something, uh, I don't know if it was in response to any other conversation where he was talking to himself. He says, I hope they do rebuild it, and I hope they rebuild it at least one story taller. So. You know, I think that there's an attitude of that we do want to move forward. We want to have a triumph out of uh, this tragedy. And, uh, and to some extent, I think architecture can be influenced. That's why I'm, frankly, some, in some sense, fear it leads us to, to the idea of safety and security. That's why I'm for kind of changing how we design uh, LAX, the airport. And I would like us to look at it, designing that in a way that's convenient for passengers, but also makes it as safe as we can make it. We are going to take a very brief break for station identification. We'll be right back with Which Way LA. <clears throat> You're listening to Which Way LA with Warren Alney on KCRW Santa Monica 89.9 FM, KCRI Indio Palm Springs 89.3, KCRY Mojave Antelope Valley 88.1, and KCRU Oxnard Ventura 89.1. We welcome your questions and comments. Tapes of this program are available. Call 310-450-5183. <laughs> Hi, this is Warren Alney, back again with a special edition of Which Way LA from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. We have with us Mayor Jim Hahn, Sheriff Lee Baca, County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, Dr. Maher Hatut from the uh, Muslim Public Affairs Council, uh, Tom Gilmore of Gilmore Associates, Constance Rice, uh, civil rights lawyer, director of the Advancement Project. We're getting uh, questions from the audience here at SciArc in downtown Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Koivo. I'm a former SciArc student. Now, this question is for Ms. Rice. Um, um, with the recent events that, are, that have happened, how do you feel about the issues with racial profiling? And there seems to be an attitude about, you know, maybe we should lax it. And I guess this is going towards uh, with the sheriff, too. Uh, sheriff, do you want to go first? I'll go first. Um, the Saturday after the bombing, 
uh, CBS News came to my house and I told them, you must be desperate for content if you're up in my house on Saturday afternoon. But they wanted me to talk about profiling and I got asked a really stupid question. Don't you think that political correctness is what's brought us here? And I said, oh, what is political correctness? I said, you know, it's whatever you, the dominant group doesn't want to do, so let's get beyond that. And she said, well, is profiling ever appropriate? I said, profiling is a perfectly legitimate law enforcement tool. Racial profiling is stupid policing because you're pulling over everybody and you're not narrowing down the pool of people. That's the purpose of profiling. We cannot canvas 15 million people in LA County, folks. We don't have the intelligence networks, we don't have the information, we can't analyze it, so profiling can't really be a very effective tool. What's good profiling? Multivariate, within context. You have got to be able to have some information that tells you whether this person requires an extra search or not. And remember, we had a profile. We had a terrorist bomber profile, a suicide bomber profile. It didn't work. Of the, seven criteria, of the nine criteria, they changed seven of them, okay? So profiling can only be as good as your information systems and your integrated analysis, okay? Now let me tell you this. Once you've gone through the security systems, no one should be allowed to say, I'm uncomfortable with that person, take them off the plane. Can you imagine for a moment, after the Murrah federal bombing that Timothy McVeigh did, can you imagine me as an African-American woman after having her car searched, everybody has their bags searched going through metal detectors, and I walk into a federal building and I say, I'm uncomfortable with white men, tall white men with crew cuts, and he makes me nervous. Please remove him from the building. How many of you think that would happen? It wouldn't happen. So once we're on the plane, once you've been through the security, once your bags have been checked, no one should be taken off of a plane simply because they may look Middle Eastern. That is absurd and it's unconstitutional. That does not mean that race, ethnicity, national origin, pattern of travel, unusual purchasing tactics, all of those criteria can make up a legitimate series, a profile that can be used to say, does this person require extra searching? Do we need to take extra measures? And then if you have an identity of a person, that's not profiling. That's actually having a suspect. That's completely different. So yes, there is a role for profiling. Are we doing it right? The FBI has, has very bad training in this. And you have to have very sophisticated, culturally fluent agents to do it. And I see very few of them. Sheriff Lee Baca. Well, I think that racial profiling, as uh, Connie described, is totally indefensible. And we in law enforcement need to be mindful of those things. And we are, in fact, in Los Angeles County, very, very mindful of this. And we do collect data within the Sheriff's Department to establish the patterns that are necessary to see if we're stepping over the line. What I'm trying to do at this point in time is to knock down another aspect of fear, and that is the fear of Muslim Americans and sheikhs who are not Muslims, who own businesses, who have a certain apparel that they wear that's traditional to their culture, and they are the targets of commentary, and they're the targets of what I call not police racial profiling, but public racial profiling. And I think that's why we've had these interfaith council meetings uh, at the sheriff's headquarters, and we've had even all of the uh, news editors of the major news stations 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and we are working in conjunction with the media as well as the interfaith community uh, to enlighten Americans as to what a true Muslim is. And, and I think that all of us as Americans now need to heighten our awareness of what's in the Quran and not listen to what criminals represent as the Quran, but listen to people who are scholars and people who are devout followers. And this uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. at the North Ridge Islamic Center, uh, the Kol Tikva Temple, the Jewish Temple membership will go to the Islamic Center in North Ridge and start the first process of a synagogue mosque dialogue. And those are the kinds of things that I think are most important in calming Americans' apprehension about what our Mes American Muslim American community is all about. Dr. Hatut of the Islamic Center of Southern California, perhaps you'd like to comment on this. Yeah, uh, what I heard, of course, the music to my ear from both uh, both speakers. Uh, it happened uh, several incidents that people were forced to depark uh, a plane 
after they were cleared through security. I think we need pre-profile profile, as was mentioned clearly. I don't mind anybody being uh, searched with scrutiny if we have certain indicators that this person might be dangerous, regardless uh, to race, color, or creed. But uh, to allow people to kick people out of the plane, and there is a case we are collecting data about one person who was quadriplegic. He was quadriplegic, and he was forced to be wheeled in his wheelchair out of the plane. Now, this is not America. There is no way. Uh, and uh, definitely that issue needs to be addressed. I, I very much support what our sheriff said because he is taking a leading role in that with uh, uh, several other leaders in uh, demystifying certain communities in the eyes of each other. Uh, at the Islamic Center of Southern California, we, we had a long-standing uh, Muslim-Jewish dialogue, and we had Muslim-Catholic dialogue, and so on and so forth. But certain areas, I think in Northridge, for example, this is a pioneering experiment, and it should, uh, it should be encouraged. We as Americans should, be, should not be afraid of each other. It will, it will be the ultimate success of bin Laden, because the word terrorism, terror means fear. And if he can manage to make people live in fear, that's victory. And we, we have to take the option of faith over the option of fear and try to carry on with our lives and with our values. We cannot destroy our values and stampede them uh, f seeking uh, false sense of security because neither racial profiling nor extreme fear or stopping buildings or whatever, this will not protect America. What will protect America is all of us insisting that America stays as America, the one that we opted for. Another question down here. Good evening, I'm Mary Norris, and I'm Executive Director of Gateway to LA, which is a, a property-based business improvement district on Century Corridor. Uh, I'm also a, a member of the Board of Directors of SIARC, and my question is directed to the Mayor. Uh, you have announced the conclusion of the proposed master plan expansion in its current configuration, and I wonder what you envision for the future of the airport. I would like to propose a fifth alternative to the four that have already been proposed as part of the master plan process and design an airport that takes advantage of bringing in uh, public transit like the Green Line, uh, other forms of, of rapid transit and uh, try to decrease the amount of traffic, automobile traffic in and around Westchester and then set up uh, uh, passenger screening and bad baggage screening and ticketing in an area that's outside the terminal area of the airport so that everybody who comes into the area where the gates are uh, to board an airplane or to meet someone who's getting off an airplane would have gone through that screening procedure uh, some distance away from the airport itself. And then I would propose something like a people mover or something else that would, would then leave that area and take people to the various gates in the various terminals. Not increase the number of gates at the airport, not increase the uh, capacity, but make it in a way so that it's efficient to get people in and out, but also provides the ultimate in safety and security. I think that if we do it that way, it's, it's worth the money that we're talking about spending on, on the airport. Many people talk about billions of dollars. I would hate for us to have gone ahead with the design and then realized we couldn't use it. Uh, because it wouldn't be the safest we could make it. And I think that in doing it that way, we'll be able to, along that corridor you're talking about, along the gateway corridor to the airport, that would really be uh, a gateway that would be um, involved in, in getting people uh, seeing that the airport is a safe place to, to go, and then when they get off, they would be uh, uh, interest, uh, meeting uh, a great, interesting part of the city that way. So I'm glad you're part of that, uh, that effort. Another question right here. 
My name is Victor Smith. I'm an architectural associate with the Department of Water and Power. My question is that the public streets between City Hall and Parker Center are currently closed and barricaded. Uh, given the new height and security we're all going to live with since 9-11, wouldn't it be better to attempt a design a solution to those uh, locations by creating possibly public plazas that would uh, be a long-term benefit and an asset to the city instead of the negative concrete barricades that foster a fortress LA image? Sheriff, that's not in your jurisdiction. Uh, maybe the mayor should take, the, take that one first. Well, I think that's, a, that's an excellent idea. Obviously, we're trying to do something temporarily. The chief of police was very concerned about uh, uh, the public buildings in and around uh, downtown Los Angeles, uh, especially in these first few days since the American response began. Uh, obviously, that's not something you'd want to see there very long. And I like your idea uh, as well, because I think that the public areas uh, downtown have been lacking. We haven't had the kind of public space in downtown Los Angeles, where people can really identify this is a, a center of a great city. Uh, so I think that that's exciting. You know, there's a great mall that was begun uh, up uh, between the County Hall of Administration and the County Courthouse. The idea was that would go all the way uh, down to uh, and, and through the Civic Center, including City Hall. We never really finished that project, and it's an opportunity, I think, to do what you're talking about, make the city more pedestrian friendly, and make it uh, the kind of public space that people are proud about. Trust me, this, this barrier thing is, is, is a temporary and not an attractive solution, one that we hope we can, we can take down quickly. Does that make sense to you, Sheriff, from a uh, law enforcement standpoint, or, or might you be creating more new problems? Well, it makes sense temporarily, and I like the way our mayor answered the question. And I also believe that other streets in downtown Los Angeles that aren't necessarily near governmental buildings should be also considered for that type of design. Tom Gilmore, is this a new opportunity for architects? Well, you never know. You know, I mean, this is a, it may be a great opportunity after all. Uh, oddly enough, those of us who do develop downtown on a regular basis um, have always sort of bemoaned the lack of, of open space in downtown, uh, other than the incredible amount of surface parking there is downtown. But in terms of actual green space, um, it, it would be very beneficial for us to have more. And for us to put some focus on City Hall and the Civic Center in general, I think really is an important thing that can happen to the city and really bring some pride of place to the center of the city. Just to add uh, to, to that, that it's kind of almost trivial to talk about it in, in, in the context of September 11th, but it's, it's worth talking about. Uh, there's going to be a lot of change in downtown uh, over the next generation. Uh, we see it coming. Uh, we have the Hall of Administration, which is the county's headquarters, is seismically unsafe, especially the end of the building that I sit in. And uh, uh, there are other buildings that need to be uh, removed, replaced. Uh, the county, the city uh, are two of the largest property owners in the, in the Civic Center area. The Disney Concert Hall is being built. Uh, the uh, Colburn Conservatory is going to be built. The Colburn School of Music has been built. There's the uh, Eli Broad, Frank Geary, depending on who you want to side with with a plan to uh, uh, to improve Grand Avenue. Uh, there's a lot that's going to go on right in, the, and there's, of course, the cathedral. Uh, there's a lot going on in that civic center area that offers opportunities in the intermediate and long term for making that area of Los Angeles, as the mayor said, a, a, a really pulsating uh, heart instead of uh, a foreboding place as it's been for my entire life. Back to the audience. Go ahead. Good, even, good evening. My name is Guillaume Atepaille. I'm a UCLA graduate in architecture. I would like to bring the panel back to a more serious note, maybe. Um, I was wondering what the panel would suggest so that we could prevent the uh, future attacks and address the root causes that uh, bring the attacks about, uh, since it seems that stamping out um, rebellion is usually not very successful in the long run. What would you suggest that we do? to address really the bottom line, uh, what is happening in the Middle East and what needs to be done. Well, let me just uh, take, take that on if I can. Once again, this is uh, Yaroslavsky, a county supervisor. Uh, and maybe I shouldn't have been the one to take it on first, but I'm, I'll, I'll speak my mind on it. Anybody who believes that this is about a particular American foreign policy 
ought to get their head out of the sand because they're not going to be able to live long. They're gonna, they can't breathe. Their head is so deep in the sand. This isn't about American foreign policy uh, in Israel. It's not about the, the American foreign policy towards Palestinians. I think it's a much, I, I step back and look at this a little differently as a historian uh, and as someone who studied that part of the world actually in my college days. I think this is about haves and have nots. I think it's about enfranchised and disenfranchised people. Where does anybody recruit people to commit suicide? Under what circumstance can you recruit people to commit suicide? Uh, and, and, and to rebel, as you said, uh, in the way they are. This is a much bigger deal. Uh, and uh, I think the last place uh, we, we should look is to the, to the uh, crescent. Uh, I look at places like, and I think Mr. Bin Laden has been looking at places like Saudi Arabia, uh, like Pakistan. Uh, obviously, he's looked at Afghanistan and other Gulf states. Uh, opportunities there for exploiting legitimate discontent, which exists in countries where there are a small number of people who control most of the wealth and a large large number of people uh, who have virtually nothing. That's the, that's the, uh, the ground, uh, the fertilizer that fertilizes the ground for this kind of a rebellion. Now, I don't know what the answer to that is from our American foreign policy. That, that, there we have a, a, a role and, a, and a, a role we have played. And other countries and other nations have responsibilities, including the leaders of those very nations. And I'm troubled by it. Uh, this isn't about one person or about one group of people, but it's, if you look at the long continuum, uh, it's much more troubling than that. Constance Rose. Mayor. My good friend, uh, the county supervisor, uh, we usually agree, and on several points I do agree, I, I, but, but I wouldn't say you have your head in the sand if you're going to pay, you need to pay attention to some of the foreign policy. We've got, we're, we're here. I'm, I'm afraid that we're creating blowback for the future right now. And part of the reason we're here is because of actions that we've taken over many years. Now, I do agree, if someone has decided that the world cannot contain you, someone who is a zealot and a fanatic and who is willing to murder 6,000 people, there's no negotiation. You don't talk to folks like that. There's nothing to talk about. But they are a very tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of the folks we're talking about. And even within the radical discontent that has been politicized on a geopolitical global level, there are specific grievances. And the reason to pay attention to it, I think, Zev, is that we need alliances. This is a battle for hearts and minds and ideology and a view of the, how the world works. And we can't win it by charging through just militarily and on our own. We have to have an alliance. And if the people you need in your alliance need certain issues addressed, that's the reason to do it. Not because our particular foreign policy, any, any iota of it, just take any seven of the, of the serious grievances off the table, you can still have the other six. That's the reason to pay attention to the foreign policy. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got the same dynamics in our own backyard. I agree the haves and the have-nots create very fertile ground for the kinds of dissonance and alienation and the inability. When you see thousands and thousands of people saying they hate us, the reason to ask the question why is not to feel guilty or to blame the victim, it's to understand how to prevent this. We can't police our way out of this. This is about making sure people want to embrace freedom and liberty and equality, even though we're still struggling to make that, equal, that, that equation work here. Modernity, women being free. If we can't get the rest of the world to embrace that vision, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing that's going to make us safe. And we have to have a very high EQ, international IQ, interracial IQ, and we have to get better cultural fluency. We have no eyes, we have no ears. We need the Arab American communities, eyes and ears. We need them with us. We don't need them yanked out of their homes and alienated like, you, like we have with driving while black. We have got to become fluent in that part of the world. We should never have been without the eyes and the ears. Connie, That's why we need to know. Connie, let me just ask you. Uh, be brief, if you will. I want to get over yeah, to Dr. I, I don't to... disagree with, with anything you said, but I think when we talk about American foreign policy, 
don't look at it just in, in, in one bilateral context, uh, as I, I may be misinterpreted the question, but I look at it in, in the broader context. Uh, we have been, I was going to say propping up, and I think that would be a pretty good uh, description, a lot of regimes in Central Asia and the Middle East who are the butt of this rebellion. Now, I don't know what your solution is, uh, or, or your suggestion is, in terms of that. Uh, Pakistan is one of them. Now, maybe that's a good thing at the moment that we did, because they're there for whatever we're using them for, but over the long haul, that's one of the grievances. Uh, and I, I won't go through the, G, to the list of countries around the Gulf and elsewhere, but it's, it's a much, much broader picture. And, and I think that, that uh, uh, you know, in political terms, uh, when, when, when Mr. Well, in political terms, Mr. Bin Laden is playing to his broadest base. He's playing to his broadest audience. The one thing that can unite as many people as, they, as he can when he, in his tape message the other day. So I think we need to look at the broader picture, and that's a very serious problem for us. It's a challenge for us, because you, in a way, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And we're, we're stuck with what we've got at the moment. Let me turn to Dr. Maher Hatid. Um, I'm glad the discussion departed from architecture to something that I understand <laughs> more about. <laughs> I think that was inevitable, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I agree with, with the supervisor that we cannot reduce the issue to the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli conflict, although it is an issue. There is no doubt about it. But suppose we solve it tomorrow, I don't think that we'll solve the problem of terrorism. However, we have to understand that it is not just the haves and the have-nots because they are not going around terrorizing Canada or Sweden or uh, any uh, country of freedom and liberty and wealth and prosperity. People there have problem with the United States and we, we will be very much guided if we acknowledge that and address it. And what happens is a person like Bin Laden and his group, they did not create these sentiments, but they use them. They, they invest on these sentiments and they exploit them. That's, that's the better word. And uh, in, uh, I had an opportunity twice in my life to sit down with two presidents of the United States. And I almost uh, begged the previous administration, as, as well as this administration, please listen to us. We want to tell you how you look outside. It is not conducive to have people to tell you America the beautiful. We have to understand to people America is not the beautiful. There is no many Native Americans celebrated Columbus Day, day before yesterday. We have to understand that there are two sides for everything, and we have to respect the sentiments of the people. And the sentiments are very, very strongly anti-American sentiments. And uh, uh, it, this is the ugly reality, and it is not... I am 65 years old. I don't look like it, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I look 85 years old. But, uh, <laughs> I am born and brought up in Egypt. I participated in the liberation movement in Egypt. And we were quoting as a model and the motivation Wilson's declarations. We used to love America. We did, we, people were not born saying death to America. Something happened, not something many things happened that led people to perceive America not as the beacon of liber liberty, but as a tool of oppression. They are right or wrong, that's a totally different debate, which I'll ask Warren to, to open space for it in the future. But those people are not crazy, they are not drunk, they are not addicts, they are not cuckoos. They have very real pains and the history of suffering that needs to be addressed. You can bomb Afghanistan to oblivion. And before that, we bombed Iraq to pre-industrial age. 
bombing will suppress terrorism, but will not eradicate terrorism. The battle is in the hearts and the minds of people. And we, we as Muslim Americans, if anything happened to us after September, is we are more aware of our responsibility and our role to win this battle. And it is our opportunity to pay back to America what it gave us. And we are available. Sheriff Baca, I think you wanted to add something. Well, I appreciate the profoundness of the, ver the various speakers on the subject, but let me say, uh, I read Jim Flanagan's column several weeks back in the business section of Los Angeles Times, and he spoke on the same level as Tony Blair did from the English point of view, and that is that there has to be a two-pronged approach to this. One, obviously, is a military intelligence and law enforcement approach, and then the other aspect of this is to listen to Mr. Hatut. Uh, he's listening, I'm making a joke here, folks. Uh, he's on the cell phone. Here's the, here's the thing that the, the second piece of this is. Uh, no, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, <laughs> Oops, I will not even ask. <laughs> this is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> no, here it is off, please. My, my greatest point of profundity is interrupted by a cell phone. <laughs> The, the important thing about the two-part approach is that we need to know, as Flanagan pointed out in his article, that the illiteracy rate in these third world nations is extraordinarily high. Close to 80% of the Muslims cannot read or write. They depend on people who are interpreting things for them, and they're easily led. And, and Thank you for your comment. We're working on that here, too. The, the important thing is, is that the gross national incomes, the average income for people in certain parts of the region ranges from as low as $500 a year, some $150 a year, others it goes up to four or $5,000 a year. This is an intolerable condition for people in a region that require things such as food, things as clothing and shelter. And so I think that when you examine the underpinnings of the motivation behind some of these individuals, uh, they have no value for their own life. And, and because of no value, uh, they're susceptible to the manipulations of criminals. And it's interesting, you can have smart criminals and dumb criminals in this world, but the ones that we're seeing now in force with this recent act of terrorism are smart people. They are able to manipulate despair, use it for a political crime that will accomplish nothing in the end, and then contort the minds of people who think that they're going to heaven as a result of their crimes. This is a tragedy beyond belief, and I'm not so convinced that any of us up here are gonna fix this, but I do know one thing, that public safety is first and foremost, because your life means absolutely nothing if you can't guarantee it in some fashion. The hour of 7.30 has arrived. I want to remind our listening audience uh, that this is a special edition of Which Way LA from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. We're going to continue to broadcast until 8 o'clock. Uh, Mirhan, however, I know, needs to leave at this hour. Mirhan will give you an opportunity to speak, and any of our other panelists who need to go are free to do so as well. We're going to continue until 8. To Mr. Han, go ahead. Thank you. I think what um, we're hearing here, especially I appreciated what Connie Wright talking about and reemphasize the idea of cultural fluency and the uh, idea that Americans, uh, first of all, discrimination is wrong, but uh, how tragically comical that uh, Sikhs have been murdered in the mistaken belief that uh, someone who's a member of the, the Sikh religion is somehow connected to what happened with uh, what bin Laden had planned. Uh, that points out, I think, the great difficulty of Americans, and in fact, right here in Los Angeles, the most diverse city, as Dr. Harud had pointed out, but we're kind of uh, culturally uh, behind right here. So many of us don't understand each other. So many of us don't take the opportunity to get to know somebody who's different and see something from someone else's point of view. We need to do that because these people who hate us uh, are being lied to. Bin Laden is lying to them. 
Uh, so many times they've been lied to saying America is out to destroy you. America is out to destroy Islam. And so they're continually being lied to without anyone giving any voice to what else is going on. And I think what we're hoping is that uh, when I went to the Islamic Center and, and, and met Sheriff Baca there at the Islamic Center, and we really felt the warmth and the appreciation of so many people there, Dr. Hadhud, and your brother was there. What we uh, also are hoping is that that message somehow gets back across the ocean to everyone else that says, you know, see, in America, this is how we are reacting. This is how we're behaving. Uh, you are being lied to. In America, everyone is free to practice their faith. We believe in these principles of freedom. Dr. Hudu said that the Wilson's principles were what guided them on independence. We have stood as a beacon to so many parts of the world. So many people want to come here. They may say they hate us, but they still want to come to America because they know this is a place of opportunity. We are not perfect. We have made mistakes. But I still say there is no other place on earth that gives the freedom and the opportunity that America does. And we need to remember that we are in the right. Uh, the, uh, people are being lied to to hate us. We need to be more culturally fluent, though, so that we can engage in that dialogue. Mayor Jim Hahn, thank you very much for being with us on our panel tonight. Thanks again. Uh, Connie Rice, I think you wanted to comment on uh, something that was said earlier. Yes. Uh, the, have, the haves and have-nots fault line is definitely one of the fault lines in this uh, sort of cataclysmic transition that we're making. And Zev, I absolutely agree with you there. And we have those fault lines here. Um, I, before I was here, Tommy Elam from the Jordan Downs Housing Project was up at my office. I've been working with him for 10 years on the uh, Grape Street Crips and what's the bounty hunters? Is it sheriff that are down there? Uh, I can't remember the name of the Bloods sect. But he's an ex-gang member who's been trying to work on the violence prevention in Ground Zero in LA County for the highest violence rates. And I hadn't talked to anybody from the other LA, poor LA, about this tragedy. And I asked him and he said, ain't no big thing. We got bullets flying all the time. LA is fourth behind Calcutta in income disparity and the wealth gap. And I don't, in this tragedy, want to lose sight of the fact that we have the very same dynamics in our backyard that Zev was referring to as one of the fault lines in this global political thing. And let's not delude ourselves. I do agree that the, that the poverty and the fact that we, ec we don't export our values. If we exported liberty and freedom and equality and prosperity for everybody to be at the table, I don't think we'd be anywhere near as endangered as we are. But we're not there yet. And the second, but I also, do, I also think that this is a much more complicated issue. Remember, the people who did the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were fairly highly educated. They had options. They, they, we, we were, the thing that stunned us was that our profile didn't work. They were well-educated, settled, quite focused, sustained an effort over several years, and understood us quite fluently. So there are other dynamics going on here, and I, I, think, I think that that's what I mean. We're blind. We should never have been in a position where 1.2 billion of the world's people were inscrutable to us. And that's the position that we're in right now, and it's going to take us a long time to build the systems and the capacities and the networks. And ladies and gentlemen, it takes human beings. If we can't connect to the other human beings in the world and translate our values and tell them that westernized, secular society does not have to wipe out anybody's way of life, and people are going to have to come to this table in, on their terms and determine their own destiny. We can't write it and we can't force it. So I just wanted to make sure we don't lose focus on the dynamics that are in our backyard. We don't give up our constitutional democracy and our freedoms out of fear. And that we get really smart. We don't need smart bombs. We need smart people.
Sheriff Buck, I, I failed to give you the opportunity to depart along with the mayor, and if you need to go, well, let me give you the opportunity now. Any final comment you would like to make? Well, Warren, I want to thank KCRW for putting on this forum. I'm really struck by the effectiveness of the media during this recent tragedy to get the information out, and I think that all of us are a better society because our media has stepped up to the plate and reported an, an incredible story, and it's still unfolding. I also want to encourage everyone here to look toward yourself as making a difference. In Sacramento yesterday, I was at the memorial that Governor Davis hosted, and we were there with 3,000 firefighters and law enforcement officials, and I spoke to the brother of the pilot of Flight 11, and I spoke to a brother of one of the stewardesses in the same flight, and I spoke to the daughter of two people who were the parents of that daughter who were in that same flight. And the one lady that spoke most eloquently about what her husband had said to her when he was in the plane as it was being hijacked, he said to her that one, he loved her, two, that they knew that something bad was going to happen because they heard about the crash in the towers, and that he, like all in the plane that were huddled in the back, said, we've got to do something. And they, what they, the way they did this, she said, was that they said, we are going to do it the American way. We're going to take a vote. We are going to decide what to do together as a team. They took the vote, they made their decision, and the rest is history. That plane crashed in the fields of Pennsylvania. What he said before they made that move to her was, I'm not sure with what I'm exactly going to do, but I know one thing, that I will make a difference. And I think the way Americans will make a difference in this current challenge that we're in is that we will all try and learn something about the Muslim faith. It's, it's a very important thing that we learn something for our own particular facts and you know, look, at, look into it ourselves. And that we'll reach out across the ethnic and racial divide and help one another in this time of great grief. And that we look toward building a stronger America. And if we rebuild the Twin Towers as I believe we ought to, Let's build it one more story high. Thank you very much, Warren. Sheriff Lee Baca. Tom Gilmore, did you have something you wanted to add to this last statement? And then we'll go back to the audience. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, actually, uh, I agree with uh, Sheriff Baca about the media and, and the fact that, uh, to a very large extent, the media has done an incredible job over the last three weeks. Although, the last couple of days, uh, I think that's changing, and I, and, and I find it uh, really worrisome. I find it uh, the beginning, you know, the end of, of, uh, of the media as, as the voice of America and the eyes of America um, is is now coming along and being replaced by uh, Fear TV. And, and I think the media is going to be part and parcel of, of what could be the worst thing that happens to us, certainly in Los Angeles and California, but perhaps throughout the nation, in terms of our ability to respond reasonably to the, to the attacks on the World Trade Center. I think that clearly an awful, terrible thing has happened, but this is not Armageddon. We are not in Armageddon at the moment. We are a very, very big country that's about to do probably the most amazing things it's done in its history. And I think the media has a responsibility not to simply do this, this you know, fright TV, terror TV take on the future of America and the future of Los Angeles. The fact of the matter is that, that you know, 18 people changed the course of American history in the various airplanes they were in. And yet in, in this room alone, we have hundreds of, of Americans that can make a difference that is every bit as big as those people made. Uh, I think it's really important important for Angelinos and for Californians and for Americans not to simply focus on the fear here, not to simply get to the level of introspection that we paralyze ourselves from doing good. We have an opportunity here, whether we're in the private sector or the public sector, to move forward. And I really think that if we spend all our time simply looking at this on a national net level and not recognize what we can do as a city, as a village, as a, as a state, to make our country better, that, then I really think we've given up, and I, and I think we've sort of fallen into the hands of people who would have us question and doubt and fear ourselves into uh, paral paralysis. So I hope that doesn't happen. 
Gentlemen here, excuse me, Dr. Hatut, do you want to make a quick remark? Uh, no, I, uh, now I can probably speak more freely. You get a man from Egypt and you sit him next to the mayor and the sheriff, and there is uh, some... Uh, uh, now, now you can say whatever you want. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, <clears throat> I speak my true mind now. No, I'm just... <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm warning against misinterpretation of things that can lead us deeper in the hole. I, I don't want to respond to the sheriff after he left, but the idea that those people, because they are poor and they are illiterate, their life has no value to them, so they go and die is wrong. Bin Laden is a millionaire, multi-millionaire. Those who are on the list of the 19 uh, ominous uh, people, they are all the upper, the higher Anchelon and the upper, upper uh, middle class or, or aristocracy really uh, where they came from. This is oversimplification. One of the things, and I, am, I, I think I'm a close friend to Zef, and we have been together through thick and thin, and the Muslims and Jews in America, they, 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 they argue a lot. Jews and Jews also, and the Muslims and Muslims, but, but nonetheless, we never lost the perspective about what's America and what is so valuable to all of us. The, one of the things that hurt me most and made me angry is when a notion went to say, you know, those Palestinian mothers put their children to die to get a chance on CNN camera. This is racist. This means that those mothers are less than any mothers. Less than dog mothers and cat mothers and bird mothers. They, they don't have motherhood. The people there, they value their life very, very much. They are family oriented. They love each other. They love American people. They hate American hegemony. And there is a difference. They, 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 they feel that the policy is unfair to them. But they don't, they still drink Coca-Cola and they, you open one hamburger in Cairo and you find lines standing there. They don't hate America, but it will be very problematic if we, if we translate their frustration and their protest into they are poor and they, their life is worthless, so they go to die. No, Kamazaki people, Kamakazi, I think this is the right thing, were dying. I think Tamil uh, in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, they go and uh, torpedo themselves. Uh, uh, religious monks in uh, Thailand used to set themselves on fire and none of them tried to explain this on religious theological background and terms. Uh, it is done by some desperate people. Definitely it is a psychopathic uh, case, not the normal. And they are few and they should be isolated and should, should be disarmed. I mean disarmed, not weapons. This, uh, their logic that instigate people and entice them should be disarmed. And this will only happen when there is a perception of kinder, gentler, more equitable, even-handed America. That's my sincere advice to my country now. Otherwise, we'll, it will be very... Pro Just imagine you talk to these people and say, you die because you don't value life. Why? Why I don't... Am I what? A war? I'm a human being. I'm, as you say here in the image of God, God have his spirit in me. Why shouldn't I value life? There is something when you feel that life is worse than death, some people go ahead and, and opt for death. And this is, it has to be studied in a more serious way, not in a reductionist way. Thank you. Doctor, thank you. Let me go back to the audience. <clears throat> Uh, Arlene Hendler, painter, Los Angeles, uh, going from global to local. Last night on KCRW, I'd like to address this to uh, Supervisor Yaroslavsky, a program on KCRW on the Santa Monica Airport. Um, in the discussion, uh, someone said that there was very little security there, very little checking, and I was wondering what the county is doing in regards to the smaller airports and uh, not LAX, but the smaller airports and the smaller sit facilities. 
Well, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I have to be very honest. Uh, and I'm very concerned about private airports generally because, in fact, I, I returned from Washington on a private airplane, and there was no security when I boarded that airplane. Uh, I have discussed it with some of our local authorities here and uh, have brought it to their attention that, uh, in fact, when this whole thing first happened, uh, when, when I watched it on television before they knew what had happened, uh, and speculation that it was a hijacking started, I thought it was a hijacking of a private plane. I thought it might have even been somebody renting a plane, a Cessna or a small plane, and crashing it into the building, because that would have been the easiest thing for my point of view to do. There is a problem there, and, uh, and, and you know, we have thousands of general aviation airports in the country. We have dozens here in Los Angeles County and its environs. Santa Monica is only one of them. So I, I, it's a concern, but I don't have an answer for you to the specific question uh, at this point. I, I, Rice. I've got a larger concern, and I'm hoping that over time we can gain confidence that the preparations that are really needed need to be made. And by that I mean, while we're having our nail clippers and tweezers taken, a Cessna was stolen off the tarmac, and baggage that's checked doesn't get screened. I, I, I don't have any confidence right now. You know, it's nice to see armed guards, I guess, but if the baggage isn't being screened, folks, and it's all premised on the old model that people would not get on a plane to die. So I'm hoping that airport security, and I'm sure they are, we just haven't, they don't have the equipment yet, and it's in the works, I hope, but the training, those poor people who have to check us, they have no clue what they're doing. They're scared to death. But they haven't received any training between what happened on the 11th and now. And they're just desperately looking for something, and they're looking more intensely. But I just hope the big pieces get fixed, including covering our reservoirs. We have open reservoirs, ladies and gentlemen. Big picture stuff here. We're about as secure as a laundromat right now. And there are things we can do that are big. We are never going to be able, put it this way, if totalitarian states couldn't stop terrorist attacks, how is an open society going to do it entirely? But there are things we ought to be doing, and I just hope that in the next six to nine months, we see the common sense big, big uh, Mack truck areas of, of holes in our security get plugged. Yeah, I, I just want to say one thing uh, before we lose sight of it, and it may not be politically correct, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. I can't, and none of us can forget, that on September 11th, we were attacked. And in a democratic society, any democratic society, the people expect, and rightly so, you expect and I expect, that we will do everything we can to protect the public. Part of that is some of the things that Connie is alluding to and that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. Part of it is putting the attackers on the defensive. And I am as social scientist as, as the next guy, but I also believe that we have a danger of paralysis by analysis. We know that one way to protect our public is to put the attackers who are attacking us on the defensive, to at least have them spend part of their day and night thinking about where we are instead of having us spend 100% of our time thinking about where they are. And I think when you look at, at the events of September 11th, this is, there's a short-term strategy, there's an intermediate-term strategy, and there's a long-term strategy. We can't forget about the short-term strategy. I personally very strongly support the policies of this administration and what they've done since then. I think they have shown remarkable restraint given their predilections or people what people thought were their predilections. But we can't sit by and analyze this situation until the next event happens. And I know that it's, uh, you know, uh, we, we'd like to solve all of the problems in a reasoned way around the table, but we, we were attacked not by somebody with a microphone sitting around a table and debating with us. We were attacked by somebody who sent a missile into three of our buildings. 
And the response has to be swift, and the response has to be unambiguous. But the response also has to be smart, Zeb. The response has to make sure that we don't create blowback again. Part of the reason we're here is because of actions we took before and didn't think, take time to analyze. And I agree with you. Well, actually, I don't agree with you. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to regret it. <laughs> you can Terror, oh, always Zeb. I agree with you most of the time. Terror is a war in the mind. It has very real death consequences. But this is a war of ideas, but it's also a mind, it's a mind game. I actually think cutting off the economic resources, root and branch, as Colin Powell said, absolutely. Uh, I thank God Condi's in there because she's the one who's holding those messaging briefings every morning. But Beyond that, getting the intelligence networks, uh, Interpol, all of our, our, our the, the networks that don't exist in the Middle East right now, critical, absolutely critical. But you want to know what really would have messed with them? What would really have messed with them is not doing what we're doing now because he had the tape ready and he's now a demigod as opposed to a lionized uh, icon. He was a demigod but, before, well, I, before Zeb, Yes, he was big, but we yeah. helped put him there when we struck missiles and missed him. Then he became an even bigger hero. So I'm just, I just want to make sure. I, our goal is the exact same. I'm just thinking that a little more deliberation, a little more cunning, being a little smarter about it, and doing an awful lot more analysis than we've been doing, I think would prevent us from being in a worse situation. What I don't want is the attacks to intensify and to become a more increased, and I'm not suggesting but how that long, your approach... Connie, how long would you deliberate before taking some action? What, what, They've taken action, what, what, would, what would you have done differently from the Bush administration? I would not be doing what we're doing right now. I would have done what they did immediately, which was immediately build the alliance, immediately start reaching out into the international uh, community. But take no military action? Not military action right now. Okay. Well, we not military reaction right now. No. We, no. we do disagree. We, we have a little less than three minutes left, and uh, I would like to get one more question from the audience in, if we possibly could. Sir? Uh, Bernard Zimmerman, architect. Um, uh, Tom Gilmore said that we should not live in fear, and that the media is projecting fear, which I agree with. We here in Los Angeles need housing, we need hospitals, we need schools, and you, Zev, you know, I know you know this, and so does the mayor, this is an emergency action. So besides getting emergency money for the war machine, we need emergency action for the peace machine. And if any time is necessary, I don't hear the Board of Supervisors talking about it. Okay, let's, let's get a response to, to that or we're going to run out of time. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Xavier. Well, <laughs> uh, if you haven't heard the Board of Supervisors talking about it, it's because you haven't been on our website. Please, please join us on www.co.la.ca.us and listen to us talk about it all the time. We, we have, the County of Los Angeles, more than any other level of government, is the human service arm of government. And the fact that, uh, that the so-called peace dividend that we've had over the last 10, 12 years uh, has not been adequately invested in our human resources in this country has fallen most heavily on our county and counties like ours all over the United States. So nobody understands that better than we do. The reason I was in Washington on September 11th, along with one of my colleagues, was precisely for, to try to save our health care system, which you and I and everybody else in this room and the three million uninsured people of this county have a stake in. So there is no question that one of the great shames of our country, and I have no reluctance in saying this, is that we don't take care of every man, woman, and child on the basics. We don't give every man, woman, and child a guaranteed health care in this country. 20% of our people have none. That's just unacceptable. There are countries with a fraction of our gross national product who cover the, their own population and anybody in there who's visiting. Supervisor, we don't. So we have a lot to do, and, uh, and, and I invite you to join with us. Let me, let me give Tom Gilmore the remaining 20 seconds that we have. Oh, Tom great. Gilmore, go ahead.
go ahead. Um, I agree with you. It's time to get to the business of Los Angeles. That's the best thing we can do. It's the most important thing we can do. We can wax poetic about this future of the world and what our part is in it, but the best thing we can do is get to work. And I think that we spend too much time sitting here circularly trying to figure out what George Bush ought to do when we ought to be figuring out what we ought to do. That's all the time we have. Tom Gilmore of Gilmore Associates, Constance Rice with the Advancement Project. Dr. Maher Hatut with the Islamic Center of Southern California, Xavier Aslafi, County, County Supervisor. Thank you all very much for being with us today. Producers of Which Way LA are Giselle Regatau and Francis Anderton. Our managing editors, Kyle McKinnon. Technical director, Mike Newport. Thanks to David Green, Steve Herbert, Margie Reeve, and Chris Seals at SciArc. I'm Armin Olney. Thanks again for joining us here on Which Way LA on 89.9 KCRW.